we want to talk to you about today is making the case for CIVI CRM in your organization. And that's for those of you who are already using it and need to make the case for some budget dollars to keep it updated, to keep it secure. And also for those of you who may be here today to learn a little bit more about CIVI CRM and hopefully implement it in your own organization. As Andrew said, uh, my organization's been using CIVI for about six years. Uh, we go way back to version 2.1, 2.2, uh, back when the case for CIVI was a little bit more challenging to make. Now that you're 4.4, 4.5, uh, the feature set is amazing. It makes it even easier to try and get your organizations to support it. And most importantly, once it's implemented, to really buy in and really make sure that that data is up to date because, I mean, what's the use of a CRM if the data in it isn't all accurate? So before we kick things off, I want to get to know a little bit about all of you in the room. I know we've got a good mix of people from nonprofits. We've got a lot of consultants, implementers, developers. So just a quick show of hands, how many people in the room are here from nonprofit organizations? A lot, great. How many implementers, consultants, developers? Great. Some people raised their hand multiple times. <laughs> How many didn't get to raise your hand yet? I want to make sure everybody gets the chance to <laughs> raise your hand. I did this hand twice. So okay. See the bottom here. Mm -hmm. Just click the bottom. Great. Okay. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> now, what we see in the room here, a lot of people with a lot of different backgrounds. Those of you from the nonprofit sector, you represent a lot of different organizations, arts organizations, educational organizations, advocacy organizations, human service organizations. Developers, you come from a lot of different backgrounds. You, uh, you help implement CIVI, you help implement a lot of other solutions. There's one thing that all of us in the room today have in common, and that's that we are in the solutions business. Now it's easy to see what kind of solutions the developers, the implementers in the room are uh, in the business of, but for nonprofits, we're in the business of solving problems in our communities. We're in the business of not just feeding the hungry, but ending hunger. We're in the business of making a real difference and changing things. And in order to do that, we need the tools to make that possible. Now, those of you with your phones, those of you with your tablets, want to make sure if you put them away, pull them back out. I'm going to ask you to open up your browsers on those uh, in just a second. Uh, we're going to do something a little bit interactive. Hopefully the technology, hopefully the internet will cooperate with us. Um, because what we want to talk about today are solutions and how CIVI CRM is a solution that can help you advance your mission. But before you start going and throwing a solution around without a problem defined, we want to define the problem. So pull out those phones, pull out those tablets, and if you visit the URL in the top right hand corner of the screen, that's nonprofits.participol, it's like participant but with poll.com. We want to see what kind of challenges are standing in the way of either implementing or maintaining CIVI CRM in your organization. Is it mostly internal where you're not getting buy-in from the rest of the staff? C uh, CRM's not a priority, uh, whether you're talking about internal budgets or something else. Is it external, having trouble finding that grant from a foundation to support CIVI CRM? Uh, worries about um, investing in CIVI CRM, making that admin or overhead ratio look a little high. Or is it option C where it's user error and you're having difficulty, somebody's trying to use it and they're just entering the data all wrong. Uh, so if you go, it's going to give you the option of A through F, just use A through C. We've got a few votes coming in, I'll give you a couple more seconds to tap on your vote. Great, that was a nice jump from 6 to 11. Okay, give 5, 4, 3, 2. Now let's see what everybody said. Hopefully this will pop up. There we go. 
It looks like answer C is our winner. <laughs> Unfortunately, this comic here is probably the best solution I have for you today <laughs> for that problem. Replace user, press any key to continue. <laughs> We do want to talk about A and B a little bit today. I want to help you. I want to give a few ideas for how you can overcome these challenges in your organization. Now, granted, every organization is different. Your internal dynamics are different, and so not every solution is going to work for everybody. But hopefully, you'll get a few tools, a few ideas today that you can take back and can help you get over these challenges um, in the organization. So, First, we want to talk a little bit about the external. We'll work from the outside, work our way in. Uh, a big challenge that a lot of nonprofits have been facing, and this has gone on for years and years and years, and this goes back to before Civi CRM was even an idea in the back of somebody's head, um, and that is the attitude around admin and overhead costs. And as people working in nonprofit technology, we get tossed into that bucket and that makes things so difficult to get funding. Um, now, in the for-profit sector, there have been a lot of studies about how much for-profit businesses need to spend on overhead, admin costs, indirect costs, whatever term you like to use. And those studies have shown that that range is anywhere between 25 and 35 percent. Now, does anybody want to hazard a guess there have been studies in the nonprofit sector as to what percentage nonprofits need uh, to be effective. Anybody have a guess? Same. Same? Same. Same? Sorry. 12? Okay. Heard a few sames. Heard 12. Anybody else? 50. Okay. The answer is exactly the same. <laughs> Not off by a couple of percentage points, exactly the same. And yet, we're faced with a lot of challenges where public perception is that the lower your overhead, the more effective your organization is. And this is pervasive. This is in media stories when you get to the holidays and everybody's doing an article on what you should look for in a nonprofit that you're going to donate to. It's in the rankings from some of the charity watchdogs. It's in a lot of things, and it just perpetuates the myth that overhead should be lower than this, that it should be 10% or 12%. But there's good news. As Bob Dylan tells us, the times, they are a-changing. <laughs> and they're changing in a number of ways. And each of the ways that this is changing should give uh, your organization more and more ammunition to be able to say, Overhead is not bad. Overhead is essential to delivering on our mission. Now first, does anybody recognize the guy in the picture at the top of the screen there? You know, it's a little faded there. That's Dan Pallada. Has anybody seen his TED Talk? Seeing a lot of heads nodding. More than three million people have viewed his TED Talk about how the way we look at nonprofits is all wrong and how we need to invest in nonprofits and sometimes you need to spend a couple of bucks in order to advance the mission. Uh, at the bottom of the screen there is a campaign that was launched last year by three organizations that anytime there's a story about nonprofits spending too much either on overhead or on paying their executives, they're the ones quoted. That's GuideStar, that's Charity Navigator, and that's the Better Business Bureau Wise Giving Alliance. Last year, they started this campaign around the overhead myth. Uh, as three organizations that in the past helped perpetuate it, having them as the key advocates saying that overhead is not a bad thing, that overhead is essential, uh, is starting to break the logjam a little bit. We're starting to see more media stories that have a balanced view when they're talking about how much nonprofits are spending on overhead. And those media stories are helping to influence foundation leaders, the foundation leaders that you're going to in order to ask for funding to implement Civi CRM and a lot of the other things you're trying to do in your organization. 
Now this very crudely <laughs> designed um, image up there is something my organization um, sent around on social media just before the July 4th holiday. Uh, put it together in probably 10-15 minutes and of course there's way too much text on here for it to go viral or anything like that. Uh, but the key thing that we learned and that we were encouraged by when this was making its way around social media is the number of foundations small community foundations, big foundations, who took this, put this on their social media page and said, my foundation is proud to fund general operating support. My foundation is proud to talk to our grantees to understand their infrastructure costs and to make sure those are funded in all of our grants. We need to get more foundations to not just think that, not just post it on social media, but actually live that. Um, and that's something that we all need to do every day. It's something where if we give these tools to our development directors as they're looking for funding, it helps when that development director can point around to the various places, the various uh, organizations that are recognized leaders in the nonprofit sector the foundations that are leaders in the foundation community to say, overhead's okay, overhead's essential. And that's how you make it okay for one to fund it, you make it okay for all to fund it. Now, there's another huge development that really flew a lot under the radar, and this happened uh, just after Christmas last year, December 26th and it's in the area of government funding for nonprofits. Before we get to the development, we've got one more poll for you, so if you pull out your phones again, same address. This is a pop quiz. Now, nonprofit sector, um, nonprofit's revenues come from a number of different places. Um, Want to focus on two um, areas. One is funding from government, those are through government contracts and grants. The other is contributions, and that includes contributions from individuals, foundation grants, uh, corporate support, bequests, all of that all lumped together. So let's take a second, vote A, B, C, or D. Uh, what do you think uh, the split is with government contracts and grants and contributions? Okay, we've got 22 votes in there. I'll give you five more seconds and then we'll check out the results. Okay, we've got a pretty uh, even split around there. We've got about a third thinking it's A, 15% from government contracts and grants, 35% contributions, about a quarter say it's B, Another third say it's C, and about 12% say it's D. The answer is C. One third of the nonprofit sector's revenues come from grants and contracts and government. And that's governments at all levels. That's the federal government, that's state government, that's local government. And about 12% come from contributions, and that's lumping together the foundations there at 1.8%, corporate giving at 0.6%, bequests at 1%, and individual giving, that's you know, donations on your website, 9.2%. Now, most people are shocked to see how much comes from government grants and contracts. Many people outside the nonprofit sector think it's mostly foundations and it's mostly individual giving, and yet that's such a small percentage. Now, uh, over the last several years, uh, the Urban Institute has been conducting um, studies, surveys of nonprofits to find out about um, just that one third over there, the government grants and contracts. Of the nonprofits with government grants and contracts, how many are having trouble getting their overhead costs covered? And when you're talking about contracting with government, those costs are referred to as indirect costs. And there's overlap between indirect and administrative and overhead, but most people use them interchangeably. Now, of nonprofits with government grants and contracts, 76% 
of nonprofits with those grants and contracts have had arbitrary limits placed on the overhead that they'll be reimbursed for. 76% of those had it capped at 10% or less. So remember that pie chart? 25 to 35% is what should be spent. And 76% of nonprofits are having that capped at 10% or less. 24% of them are getting zero, not a penny. And how can you expect to deliver services if you can't fund the infrastructure? Well, the thing you can do is for that 33% there, the government can say to the nonprofit, oh, go get a foundation grant if you want to cover those expenses, if you want to pay to have the computers that you need to do the work. It, it's okay that I, I won't subject my grandmother to continuing to use Windows XP, but if you guys want to use something newer, if you guys want to try to change the world, solve the problems in your communities, go, go somewhere else to find the funding for that. Foundations will take care of you. The foundations with their 1.8%, it just doesn't make any sense. It, it doesn't work. So I was saying there was big news, a late Christmas present, if you will, uh, late last year, and that comes from the White House Office of Management and Budget. Now, I know most of the news stories you see nowadays are about how nothing gets done in Washington. Uh, and my wife works for a member of Congress, so I'm allowed to say it too. Uh, but one huge thing for the nonprofit sector um, did get done. And this is, uh, this is something that was implemented December 26th of last year, goes into effect December 26th of this year. Uh, what's called new OMB uniform guidance, and it governs um, grants and contracts that are funded by federal dollars. So that's grants and contracts you have directly with the federal government. That's grants and contracts that you have with state government that utilize federal dollars. The key provisions that nonprofits should know about, this applies to all grants and contracts that use federal funding. It doesn't matter if it's a state government, they get half the money from the feds and half of it is from the state coffers. If it's got one federal dollar in it, this applies to you. Um, nonprofits that uh, contract with the federal government get to establish what's called a um, negotiated indirect cost rate. There's a formula that calculates how much you spend on administrative costs and they will reimburse you that rate. If a nonprofit already has one of those rates in place, the states, the localities, they must honor that federal rate. If you don't have a rate, you are empowered to negotiate one. It's not really a negotiation, it's a math problem, but um, you're empowered to have one of these rates. If you don't have the bookkeeping systems in place or you just don't have the capacity to negotiate that rate, you get a minimum of 10%. And you cannot waive the right to get at least that 10%. A lot of times, a lot of mandates that come down from the federal level, state governments, local governments, they'll try to go to the nonprofit and say, you know what, you, you really want this funding, you're gonna sign this waiver so that we don't have to follow those regulations, saying you agree to let us pay you 2% or 0%. There is explicit guidance from the Office of Management and Budget says they cannot do that. So now, remember these 76% of nonprofits that were getting less than 10%? Now all of them are up at, at least 10%. Maybe they're up at 25 to 35%. Imagine what that means for the nonprofit sector. Now that doesn't mean this, doesn't mean a windfall, there's not new money in the federal budget somewhere. Uh, but it does mean that your nonprofit can dedicate some of the funds in those contracts that you have to administrative costs, to overhead costs, to technology, to the things that are going to make it easier to achieve your mission. Now, for those of you without uh, government grants and contracts, there's something in it for you too. That's the ripple effect. Number one, if you do have a grant and contract, if you do have that indirect cost rate, it's something you can use when you're talking to foundations. 
you're not going to them saying, well, we'd like to spend 20% on our overhead costs. And they say, well, where'd you come up with that number? Now you've got a solid number, a solid thing that you can go to them with. For those of you without government grants and contracts, now the nonprofits that had to go to those foundations and ask for their cut of that 1.8%, uh, now they don't have to do that to get funding for their technology. That opens things up for foundations to be funding more things for other nonprofits. So it's a little bit of a ripple effect that will hopefully help everybody. Now I talked a little bit about external. Let, let's move internal a little bit. One of the big challenges once you do have the funding is everybody in your organization is trying to get a piece of that budget. You've got one dollar to go around and program staff's going to get the, the big piece there and you're left kind of going and chasing the scraps that are flying away hoping to get funding to implement something. You can also look at it as pieces of a pie. You know, you're all there, the pieces of the pie are never going to be uh, completely equal. You're going to have one of those smaller slivers of the pie. But what if we change the dynamic? What if trying to get them to cut the pie in a little bit different direction, if we work together with those with the other pieces of the pie, and instead of trying to do something in a zero-sum game, we grow the pie. And that's what I want to talk a uh, little bit about next. Now, in a lot of organizations around budget time, you've got the program staff, they want to implement something new, and so they're making a case. The fundraising staff, they want to do another mailer, they want to do another event, <coughs> and you're there trying to uh, make sure you've got the infrastructure to do it. It's tough to um, do things on your own. And so you want to change the dynamics in the organization where instead of competing, you're all working together because Implementing CIVI CRM, keeping CIVI CRM updated is something that's in the best interests of everyone. And part of that is changing the dynamics, changing the way your peers look at things, your colleagues look at things, but starting first with changing the way that we look at things. The key thing to start with is CIVI CRM is not your destination. You are not trying to get funding to implement CIVI CRM. You are not trying to get funding to keep CIVI CRM updated. Now, for the nonprofits in the room, a show of hands, look at, looking at your mission statements, how many of your mission statements say, we will implement CIVI CRM? <laughs> Do we have somebody from the <laughs> CIVI CRM Association? <laughs> Okay, we've got a couple of exceptions. <laughs> For most of you in the room, CIVI CRM is not the problem that you're trying to solve in society. The way you want to look at it is that CIVI CRM is not the destination, it's your passport to get to that destination. How can CIVI CRM help your organization achieve its mission? How can CIVI CRM help your development director be more effective in their job, bring in a few more dollars this year, target the fundraiser a little bit more. How can it help your program staff uh, target the services better? Now, I want to walk through a few scenarios, how things can work. Uh, and this is from experience working with some folks who have had a lot of challenges getting CIVI CRM uh, implemented in their organizations and then getting it updated. Now, one of the big things in the news the last few weeks, the last couple of years, is around data security. Now, who in the room already has CIVI CRM implemented in your organization? How many of you have challenges getting budget dollars to keep it updated? We've got a few. Now, if you're going to your CEO, you're going to your finance director saying, hey, we, we need a couple thousand dollars budgeted each year to keep this up to date, it's really tough to make that case and say, well, look at the great new features in 4.5. We need 4.5. We're doing just fine with 4.4. We we're, we're just fine with 4.1. Data security <laughs> is your answer. And it's also how you get your development director on board to help you out with uh, getting that funding. Uh, ben Franklin said an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Also, 
Talk to your development director. How easy is it going to be when your nonprofit joins the ranks of Home Depot, Target, others who have had the data hacked? Now, would you rather spend a couple thousand dollars to make sure you're on the most recent, most secure version of Civi CRM? Or would you like to take the dip in your donations for a couple years while you get donors back uh, feeling secure about donating to your organization? It's one way to get your fundraising folks on board. Now for fundraising and for data staff, not data staff, program staff, uh, say we need to have Civi CRM, we need to have data on the people who we're serving, we need to have data on the people who are donating to us. And you've got all this data, and great, wonderful, getting all this data sounds like it's going to be a drag on my time. I don't have time to be updating this stuff. I, I'm already overworked. And what do, you, what do you need to do with this data? You know, I, I've got an Excel spreadsheet. I've been using this Excel spreadsheet for 20 years. It's just fine. <laughs> well, need to find the things that are making their lives difficult. Remember Staples with their easy button? <laughs> the way to get Civi implemented in your organization and to get people to use it is to be their easy button. Instead of going to them and saying, hey, we need this database. We, we need to be able to work with our members. We need to work with our donors better. Approach it from a different perspective. How can I help you achieve our mission? How c what is standing in the way of taking the next step in getting to what we're trying to do? We're feeding a lot of people. That's great. We're introducing the next generation to a love of the arts. That's wonderful. What's standing in the way of taking the next step? And think about it and see how Civi CRM can help. That way you're not going to them with a solution to a problem that hasn't already been defined. It's also how you get funding from foundations. It's not going in and saying, hey, can we get some funding for a new website, for a new CRM, for new computers. It's looking at the priorities of those funders and showing how you can make a difference, how your nonprofit can get one step closer to achieving your mission and no longer needing to exist. And Civi CRM can make that possible in a lot of ways. It can make it easier to target where your services need to be delivered. It can make it easier to find the next people to attend the next fundraiser. It can be, you know, if you're an arts organization and you've got great attendance at your performances, but you're seeing a lot of people from one area, not as many from another, Data and Civi CRM can help you identify that, can help you formulate the strategies to overcome that and to take the next steps. But the first step is changing our perspective. We need to stop going in and saying we've got a solution to all the problems. We need to make sure that our CEO, that our finance director, that our finance committees aren't seeing the technologist as the person who just wants the new toy to play with. And granted, we, we do want the, the latest toy to play with, but it's not for the sake of having that new toy, it's for the sake of achieving the mission. Now you want to plant the seeds that say, this is not just about implementing something for implementing its sake, it's about making a difference. It's about taking things to the next level. You need to be able to tell those stories. And Civi CRM can help you with the bar charts in the next uh, annual report by being able to track things more efficiently than an Excel spreadsheet. That's one step toward it. Because then you can get more donors. Then you can move things closer to achieving your mission. And the way to do that is not by competing, with your colleagues, it's by working together. It's by finding what are the pain points, what are the ways we can solve things. Now, up here again, we've got a lot of people, a lot of different things, a lot of different colors, red, orange, blue, green, purple. 
Everything's diff every organization's different, every organization's unique. The people you work with are unique. So you need to find the ways to get, uh, get their buy-in. But again, the key is not trying to say, we need this, but to ask first. Find out how you can help them. Because all of you do have one thing in common. You're all working toward a goal, a mission, of helping others. Now, a few tools to walk away with. Number one, information is powerful. <laughs> you want to get things done, you want to make the case. Uh, just saying, hey, Civi can make a difference, Civi can make things easier for you, doesn't go a long way. Look at the Civi CRM website. There are a lot of case studies on there. Think about the problems that your colleagues have talked about uh, dealing with and look at those case studies. I'm sure one of them in there is from an organization with a similar challenge. That way you're not just saying that Civi can make a difference in your organization, but you've got a case of another organization, maybe five other organizations facing a similar challenge and how Civi made a difference for them how it increased attendance at the next uh, performance of a chorus line, how it helped them find the right people to uh, be potential donors in the future. Stay connected with the Civi CRM community. You've all taken the first step by being here today. A number of you, I'm sure, are uh, being part of the community online as well. Stay connected to that. For those of you that are nonprofits, Yes, it's time for the shameless plug portion of our <laughs> presentation. Uh, there is a state association of nonprofits near you. Be connected with them. Join them. Take part in, uh, in their trainings. Most of all, get the news from them. That's how you find out about the OMB uniform guidance. That's how you find out about the latest developments with busting the overhead myth so that we can make sure that we have the funding to implement the technology that you need to get your job done. It's a nonprofit association in just about every state, not every one, uh, but these organizations have a lot of information to share with you. Uh, they also, some of them have discounts available as well. Uh, connect with my organization. Uh, we'll keep you updated on the latest developments and uh, you know, certainly feel free to sign up for our newsletters, let your CEOs know to sign up for our newsletters, follow us on Twitter with our two Twitter handles, um, and we'll keep you up to date because uh, I'm the one doing the, the first Twitter handle there. I love technology. I, I started my love of technology as one of those teenagers in my parents' basements designing websites to be able to afford to go to college. I've loved technology forever, and so I, I like uh, keeping my eye on resources that will help fellow uh, nonprofit techies be able to get their work done. Now, just remember two things I want to leave you with. Number one, we are all in the solutions business. Make sure that you're looking at Civi CRM as a solution that's a path, that is a passport to getting to the destination your nonprofit is trying to get to. And the way to start getting to solutions is to ask what the problems are. Now, I was going to use my cat on here, but my wife wasn't cool with that, so we had to go with a stock <laughs> photo of a cat. <laughs> so think about how can Civi CRM help us achieve our mission? And with that, I'll conclude, and I think we've got another minute or two, so if anybody has questions on how CVCRM can make a difference in the mission of your organization, I think we've got a couple minutes to take a couple of those. We've got one over here. Well, no one else was asking. I was just curious how many of the, how many of the national organizations that you put on that American map uh, use CVCRM? Uh, well, e each of those is a state organization, but um, I about six or seven at this point. We've been moving a lot over. Um, a lot of them started out in Salesforce, 
um, because Salesforce has that nonprofit starter pack. They give you up to 10 licenses for free. You hear free, you see big multi-million dollar organization. Um, and so a lot of people were really excited by that. They went to it and they found, wow, Salesforce is really nice, but I need 10 other programs to plug into it. I need constant contact. I need Eventbrite. I need this. I need that. Wow, this is a lot of work. It's nice that they all integrate. Hey, next time you're doing your website, uh, and especially as a lot more of them have been transitioning to Drupal websites, uh, hey, have you looked at Civi CRM? Wow, it does my event registration for me. Wow, it manages membership. Wow, it manages uh, donations. Wow, I can track my interactions with my members so easily. This is great. Where was this all my life? And so it, it's a matter of as uh, people are kind of opening the door and looking at what they're using now, uh, a lot more of them are making that transition. So it, it's nice to see in every new version of Civi with enhanced features and enhanced performance. Um, I think that's been one of the biggest things that, that has helped get a few more of them on it. All of the performance enhancements that uh, we've seen throughout the versions three, the three versions and the four versions um, have really helped kind of make the case even more. So, yes? Please, uh, thank you, by the way. Is your deck available? The slide deck? Uh, sure, I can make it available. I'll, um, I'll share it with the organizers so they can uh, share it. That's really cat. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it is a really cute cat. <laughs> Other questions? Yes? Um, I'm not sure how this goes, is, but a lot of organizations have a database system they already use mm -hmm. and have invested a lot in. How to switch them over to Civi, you know, it's open source, which is free, like, uh, Free like kittens? No. Free like kittens. Like <laughs> so how, have you ever run into that where you're trying to like show the value of switching over? Yes, uh, a lot of times. And it started with my own organization. Um, I've been with the National Council of Nonprofits for a little over nine years. When I got there, um, we were using a, um, an access database that was very complex. Uh, from looking at it, it may have been overly complex just because whoever designed it wanted to show how much they could do. Um, and that, that's a big danger. Uh, when you're implementing Civi, make sure you define exactly what your organization is trying to do and make sure your developer, when they come in, is not asking you, okay, what fields do you want to track? Make sure your developer is asking the question, what, what are the things that are holding you back from achieving your missions? That's how you get to what you need, and so you don't have a lot of features in there that you don't need. I think there's a session later this afternoon that's talking about that. Um, to get back to the question, um, one of the key things was, even though a lot had been invested in that database, I asked the question of my colleagues. What is hol holding things back? What, you know, you're, you're trying to do various things. What, what's the barrier? And the barrier was any time they wanted to enter the membership dues we just got from an organization, it took five minutes. All they wanted to do was open the database, open one record, and type in one place $500. And it took five minutes. And granted, hopefully none of you are in that situation today. Um, but the key is looking at what the challenges are. What's taking too long? You know, what, what are the biggest time sucks that you're facing with the current solution? Is it that you have to manually enter something over here, and then you've got to enter it over there? It's that you have to export from this system, and then take the Excel spreadsheet and rename some of the columns so that they'll map correctly to the solution over here. Uh, it's really finding those pain points and saying, look, I, I know we invested a lot in this uh, solution over the years. I know that um, there are people here who have been using this solution for 20 years and learning something new. It's not something they want to do, and that, that's completely fair. Um, but if you can demonstrate how this will make their jobs easier, 
how rather than updating something in three separate places, they update it once. How it will make things easier for those who are donating to you on your website. I mean, if people come to your site and that donation form is difficult, or you're going and shuttling them off to the Network for Good site to donate to you, or Kimbia, or somewhere else, and you're losing those folks to an external website and they're not coming back, uh, you need to find what those challenges are uh, and see if Civi CRM is something that can help you overcome them. And it won't be the solution in all cases. In some cases, uh, inertia will win out. It's, it's tough. Uh, but if you come into the conversation not saying, I have a solution, let's find the ways that it, it works for you, you're not going to get anywhere. If you approach it from, look, we, we've got challenges. Let, let's define those challenges and let's see what's right. And at the end of the day, maybe it's Salesforce. Maybe it's something else. Uh, but I'm pretty confident Civi CRM would have to be high on the list. Sure. Anyone else? OK, hearing none. Thank you all, and I hope you enjoyed the sessions the rest of the day. A lot of great ones.